much, Tim. Uh, I really appreciate uh, the invitation to uh, uh, meet with and uh, speak with your class today. Uh, I'm delighted to be here and, and hope that uh, I can uh, spark some uh, interesting insights and conversation as I know that I always, uh, from groups like this, uh, get a lot of uh, insight and benefit myself from our Q&A and so forth, which we'll pretty much do toward the end of, of this session. Uh, as uh, Tim mentioned, I'm uh, a futurist. I consult, uh, write books and articles, and uh, do various keynote speaking around the world. And my first book uh, was a few years ago. Tim and I met in the course of uh, shortly after I wrote that. And this recent book came out this year, Future Minds. And I'm going to be speaking a little bit about the nature of uh, intelligence and how that might impact or affect uh, some of your thinking around uh, design and other uh, areas uh, in, during the course of the hour or, or, or more, where, whatever we're going with. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and start with a screen share here. And um, so what we're going to be talking about today is a number of things that I explored in the course of this book. And what I'm interested in AI, but I really am fascinated with what intelligence itself is. I have been for a very long time and have actually wanted to write this book for a long time. And in the course of exploring it, uh, in order to write this book, I had to meet with and, and interview a lot of different researchers from a lot of different fields, uh, did, read a lot of, uh, awful lot of uh, research papers, uh, in order to try and understand what intelligence is as a starting point. And fortunately, um, you know, that research did get me to something that I think was, for me, very interesting. Now, one of the things uh, about intelligence that makes it so challenging, uh, it's what Marvin Minsky, uh, one of the AI pioneers, uh, used to refer to as an, a suitcase word. And he used this term to refer to certain concepts like consciousness, emotion, intelligence, and a number of others to essentially talk about words that were, had a lot of ambiguity in terms of their meaning, connotations. Uh, they you know, could mean very, very different things depending on who you were speaking to in what field and so forth. And in the course of doing this uh, research, I came across more than 200 definitions of the word intelligence that really ran the gamut from the very, very uh, basic logic and rational thought that we perform uh, all the way to different types of systems, different types of organisms, all the way down to uh, single-celled organisms and referring to certain types of behavior and, and um, ability to respond to their environment. So my question really in starting was what is the nature of this, this thing we call intelligence? Is, is there an answer? And I felt that I did come up with a pretty good idea if you really want to break it down to a, a very fundamental foundation. And that is that within the nature of the, the way thermodynamics, entropy, and complexity work in the universe, and this is going to be very, very abbreviated because it's, as Tim knows, covers several chapters uh, just to go through this part. Essentially, there are a number of different systems that at different levels that share a range of similarities. They don't behave the same way, but there are at certain fundamental levels, whether you're talking about physical systems and atoms and the nature of how these form molecules to how complex molecules can lead to uh, very, very simple life or pri before that even autocatalytic uh, systems, chemical systems that themselves are capable of replication and reprodu reproduction, all the way through multi-celled life, 
larger fauna, primates, ourselves, and possibly, ultimately, uh, beyond that. Uh, so in the course of looking at that, what I came up with was a definition that essentially runs to the effect of an emergent systems, of intelligence is an emergent system's ability to respond to its environment in order to improve its conditions, perpetuate itself, and maximize its future freedom of action. I actually borrow that from a, a physicist, that last phrase. Uh, and essentially, the idea is that if you, as you look at different levels of systems, that those that are able to perpetuate themselves and improve their conditions and actually continue themselves into the future are the ones that are going to effectively be successful and propagate versus those that are uh, much more random in nature or stochastic. So it's in that kind of a sense that I'm looking at intelligence up and down the scale, really across an, what amounts to being an entire spectrum. So we can use that to refer to everything from single-celled organisms to multicellular life, plants, larger animals, ourselves, and possibly, as I was uh, saying to Tim just as uh, we were starting off, I'm not sure if everyone was here yet, uh, possibly uh, AI and uh, technological uh, systems. Now, one of the things that I talk about a lot is the, and within the, these books as well, is the idea that we are co-evolving with technology. This has been an ongoing trend that we have been part of for mil literally millions of years. Now, this begins uh, some through five, four million years ago with uh, an ancestor of ours, Australopithecus, who overall was not a particularly uh, exceptional uh, animal. Uh, they were probably based on cranial capacity, on the order of intelligence of a chimpanzee. Uh, they might have had a little more uh, capability, but not a lot. Uh, they were not as powerful or as strong as a number of their predators. They would have gotten eaten a lot, probably. Uh, but sometime around maybe three and a half million years ago, something incredible happened because some of them actually started to make stone tools. Now, we tend to think of, we watch cartoons, we think of what a stone tool is, but actually the creation of an edged stone tool is a very complex process. It takes a modern human something on the order of 100 hours of practice just to become moderately proficient. We have the benefit of knowledge, levels of self-control that these early primates simply did not have. And so the ability to not only develop this very, very slowly, uh, but to also communicate it across literally 150,000 generations at least uh, is pretty phenomenal. And it was very, very slow that technology is one of the most successful in our history since it has lasted for three and a half million years. Uh, and in the course of that time, uh, not only were we creating the first technology, but that first technology was changing us. And that's a, a big deal. And it's something that has gone on with technology ever since. Technology changes us, and in the case of a lot of it, including this early technology, it actually changed our brains. A uh, number of things happened uh, that can contrib it contributed to the development, uh, basically the tripling of cranial capacity from Australopithecus to ourselves during those three and a half million years. All of this time, we don't have what we consider to be vocal speech, vocal language, uh, spoken language at the, for much of this time. That really develops only about 300,000 years ago based on looking at the genetics, looking at changes in the hyoid bone and so forth, things like that. So as that technology changed us, we moved into a new era of in which we continued to develop, we continued to develop technologies and those check, same technologies altered us. They altered our brains. They altered, they 
allowed us to create culture. They allowed us to accrete and create more and more technology. It, again, this was really, in many respects, a very, very novel form of replication in the world. This was the beginning, the very first true replication of a, of a non, of, of something virtual, of, of something that was not itself physical. The concepts, nothing like that had ever existed in all of the universe's history, possibly on some other distant planet, but we really do not know that. So we move through this period, we, as you might notice, we move with accelerating progress into, uh, as we move into the modern era. Uh, remember, it's only about 400 years ago that we start to see the scientific revolution, and the age of enlightenment and things like that. Uh, and we're continuing today into an era where we have, excuse me, computers and the um, technologies that are really advancing our world even more quickly. Now, in the course of doing this, all of these devices need a means of interacting with them, an interface. Now, in the computer terms, we've been dealing with interfaces for some time. Uh, the early computers were hardwired, and then we had punch cards and punch tape. We had the command line interface after that. In the 80s, the GUI, the graphic user interface is developed. And today, in the recent decades, we've started to move into the era of natural user interfaces. Uh, these are all essential for us to be able to interact with and work with these very, very complex systems. So about 40 years ago, 1980, I think it was, uh, a technologist, Brenda Laurel, uh, wrote a, a book about uh, interfaces uh, for Apple Computer. And in that introduction, she refers to, she, there's a quote that I love to use, um, that any sufficiently different, two different systems require the need for a well-designed interface. And really, the more complex these systems get, the more we need interfaces to be able to act as our intermediary between the different levels of uh, hardware and, and electronics and so forth and be able to actually uh, allow us to achieve things. And here we're in an era when 65, 70 years ago, you had to be have a PhD to be able to program a computer to use one. Uh, today, you can put an iPad in front of a toddler and they can go to town. They can start working with it. And that's a really, really big change. But a lot of that is down to uh, interface design and interface uh, implementation. So I'm going to diverge here for just a moment. I asked uh, Tim a little bit about this earlier. Uh, in the course of talking about some of this a little later, uh, Keep in mind something that Stuart Brand, who was uh, the founder of the whole Earth uh, catalog back in the 70s, um, he created a concept called pace layering. And the idea of this is that a number of different elements of our world kind of sit on top of each other. And some of them are operating at much different rates of change than others. And this is really, really important, not only to visualize and understand how change occurs and how it affects your planning for different aspects of that, but as different parts of this get out of whack with each other, as say technology advances more quickly than certain institutions are able to respond to it, to protect us, we get friction, we get an interaction that it makes it creates problems. And so perhaps we don't have enough regulation for a period, and then we see a big overshoot, a, an overreach, and all of a sudden we have too much regulation for something that's not fully or well understood as well. So there's this constant push-pull that's going on between these layers, and it's becoming more and more evident as our world accelerates. This wasn't as obvious. 200, 300 years ago, 1,000 years ago. But today in our modern world, uh, the rate of change, the, the, how rapidly we see different social media and different 
uh, cultural change occur. Uh, there's just a lot of disparity between these different uh, elements that we have to deal with in our world. Uh, one of the interesting things before I finish that Brand talks about is that the these lower level elements, they move more slowly and they actually provide more of the foundation for our society. And where we see the change or a lot of the early change is in those upper, faster regions. So what he commented or what he, he said about it is that fast learns but slow remembers. And this in many respects is, is worth keeping in mind in terms of how those lower or slower uh, levels are providing stability for our society. So just, I thought it was worth mentioning uh, briefly in the course of uh, today's talk. So that takes us very quickly or you know, briefly. Uh, three years ago, I published a book, Heart of the Machine, which was about artificial emotional intelligence or what's known as emo emotion AI. Now, emotion AI is systems that interact with human emotions and they can interact with, they can read, it can detect, it can even potentially influence human emotion. Now that sounds like an interface to me. Uh, it's a way that we can actually get even further the natural user interfaces and be able to understand or anticipate what a person's needs are before they necessarily even are consciously aware of them themselves. Now that has some good benefits uh, for certain kinds of things, but it also can be misused very readily as well. Another thing about this technology, though it's been pretty much underway for a good quarter century um, and started being commercialized a little over a decade ago, uh, there's been a lot of pushback in recent years, people talking about that this really isn't reading or understanding emotion. And that's totally true because these systems, these computers, these programs don't understand. They find patterns. They do things with your, your data. They respond to very basic inputs and outputs. This is due to a lot of the ways that, this is due a lot to how and why AI has been created the way it has. But here in recent years, uh, in the last couple of years, uh, we've started seeing more and more push in the direction of what's being termed the third wave of AI. Now, in the first wave, which was very, very logic-based and very rule-based, uh, it was a lot of it was due to the fact that we didn't have a lot of processing power at that time. Second wave came along by the 80s and 90s, and then by the 2000s, we start to see it really take off. These are the neural nets, neural networks, and they are much better at doing things like pattern recognition and so forth, but they still really don't have any contextual understanding. Well, that first wave is said to describe, and the second wave is said to categorize what they're looking to do with this third wave of AI that's being worked on by various uh, factions and research labs is to that it will be able to explain essentially systems that will have a better sense of what cause and effect are of abstract reasoning of being able to learn from very very limited input and to accrete knowledge much more like human beings do by building on prior knowledge as opposed to simply starting from scratch and learning a pattern uh, as uh, current AI does. That changes things when you talk about something like emotion AI because essentially you can theoretically get to something much closer to theory of mind with this kind of a system, a system that can actually understand the nature of cause and effect and how different people are going to respond to different kinds of input stimulus and so forth. That gives us, that gives these systems much more potential capability to um, be used more accurately, but accurately in which way? 
in a way that's positive for us, that uh, kind of seems like our world's becoming magical, or in very negative ways where we see levels of surveillance, levels of uh, algorithmic influence that are really detrimental to our humanity. So that's a little framing of one area that I think is relevant here because some interfaces don't understand who we are. They just, we're just things. And if we look ahead, we may actually be in an era when AI is not thinking the same as us, but is capable, has capabilities that are much more in keeping with what, how we think, and therefore are very different tools and possibly dangerous ones. So all of this is leading to a lot of different use of data, a lot of different algorithmic influence. And algorithmic influence we've been talking about fairly recently uh, a lot because of what's been going on in social media, Facebook, the use of different social media platforms to engage at us and to alter our behaviors, primarily to make profit. And that's not necessarily, that's not a good thing. All, we can say that marketing and sales have been doing this forever, but the fact is that we're moving into a new and different territory uh, where we're kind of outgunned in some respects. Uh, so just turn back the clock a decade, just as an example, and in uh, 2011, a, uh, a couple of researchers uh, went to do a project at Microsoft Research, Adam Sadelik and John Crum. And this was the Far Out system. They called it Far Out. What they did was they put GPS trackers for several months. They paid a number of employees, maybe three or 400, to wear these all the time and it just tracked and kept track of everywhere that they went. And they had been working on an algorithm. Well, they got through those several months and they took all of that data and they plugged it into their algorithm, did a little tweaking, and they found that they could determine where any of those people would be within a one block radius on any given day, within, the, within an hour of that day, within, with an 87.3% certainty uh, up to 18 months out. Now that is scary, it's phenomenal, it says a lot about how, how repetitive our routines are, uh, but you know we tend to go back and forth between stores and between work and home and so forth. So you, know, you can see how it would be possible for a system to actually mine this. Now move ahead a decade or more and not only are these algorithms getting better, but over time, we're building in the internet of things, we're building uh, systems that are capable of having more contextual understanding, and that gets kind of scary. So just for a little, uh, what should we say, uh, scenario uh, I'd like to share with you for just a second. Um, this is something that is taken from uh, one of my books. A fashionable young woman walks along a high, street window a high street window shopping. As she does so, her Gucci augmented reality glasses tell her all about the items she's viewing. Rate reviews, ratings, competitor prices, etc. Meanwhile, thanks to the Internet of Things, a shop a few hundred feet down the street is observing her. It feeds her image from its cameras to its software as a service provider that it subscribes to. The service reports on her demographic style and likely purchasing habits. From there, the store's computer calculates there's an 82.3% likelihood she'll be interested in one of their skirts. It quickly uses several other services to generate a rotatable 3D avatar to send to her glasses. The woman casts a quick glance at the image, then dismisses it. Had her social media settings been more open, the store's computer would have known she already had a very similar skirt. However, her gesture, gait, and micro-expressions tell the store all it needs. The computer estimates there's a 93.2% probability the young woman will buy one of the new jackets they just got in. It generates a new image and sends it along with a 30-minute flash coupon. Despite the woman's best efforts, the system can tell she is very interested. 
She soon enters the store and within minutes, the transaction is completed. Now, we can look at this as something that some people may want. This, is, this could be the way some people will want to shop in the future, but it's also incredibly invasive and potentially incredibly predatory in terms of the relationship between the shopper and the seller. Here you have a real-time feedback loop that's taking place because the individual is putting out little micro expressions that we can't, that we do unconsciously, that these systems can read and be able to make determination of what their mental states are about certain things, their responses and so forth. This creates a loop that a script, a, a system can rapidly interact with and essentially manipulate us much in the way, differently, but much in the way that we're seeing manipulation today on social media and so forth. So these are issues and concerns that we need to think about as we move forward with designing for these future systems, these systems that are more intelligent, not necessarily intelligent like us, but differently and more intelligent, systems that are going to need us to implement ethical and responsible design principles in the course of creating the, the ways that we interact with them. Uh, be, and we're going to probably need to have some level of regulation. I can't believe that the in the, a lot of these industries are going to be self-regulating in the course of this, but that's a whole different story. So as we progress through interfaces, we eventually reach the point where the natural user interfaces have given way to BCIs, probably the most, in many respects, intimate interface that we can imagine having. Now, these are still really early days. And while we can tweet, we've had people play games with BCIs, be able to control wheelchairs and so forth, we're still a very long way off from this becoming something that is going to be used electively. Uh, it's going to be primarily used for therapeutic purposes for probably decades yet. Uh, there's a lot of ethical issues with putting something inside of somebody's skull. Uh, even if you're talking about non-invasive forms, uh, they're not as accurate and they're going to be uh, still, there's going to be issues and concerns. But uh, because this has been an ongoing trend for so very long, this continuing development of uh, co-evolution with technology, uh, I do believe that we are going to eventually uh, develop a level of interaction with it that it's going to be almost impossible to, for us to know where one aspect starts and another begins. Now, early on, this is going to be just offloading resources, uh, processing, accessing services, much like we do with our smartphones. Uh, and during this coming decade uh, with smart glasses, AR glasses and so forth, Apple's been talking about, or rather there have been rumors that Apple's going to be getting rid of um, screens entirely uh, on their phones by 2030, we'll see, but we're expecting glasses in the, the next year or three. So as we move into an era like this, what kinds of vulnerabilities do we have to think about? What types of issues when we're talking about all of these possible cognitive biases that people can interact with and uh, influence. So at the point when we're starting to see this technology be prevalent, be widespread, what happens when your BCI is hacked? What happens when effectively a part of your brain is hacked? This is not science fiction. It sounds like it, but there have already been all kinds of proofs of concept of different types of implantable medical devices that have been shown, demonstrated to be hackable. Uh, that's concerning. So how, what kinds of filters, what kinds of protections, what kinds of mitigations do we put in place for the users so that they can be protected and these technologies can be um, utilized, but utilized 
for positive purposes. Uh, and this has always been the case with technology. All technology can be used for positive and negative things. This is not to say all technology is neutral, but all technology can be used in positive and negative ways. And we, people will inevitably try to do that. That's what we've seen with the internet. And there's money, once there was money to be made, it became very, very interesting to a lot of people to explore how can we exploit this. So we have to think about those things when we talk about um, uh, intelligence and these new systems that we're going to be working with. One last area I'm just going to touch on before we can move over to Q&A, unless Tim, unless we're running out of time, I know where if you're good, I'm good. Okay, so uh, I couldn't have a talk like this without talking about a little bit about some of the ways that we can actually use AI going forward to help with design. And some of this number of you will already be familiar with, but uh, wanted to just kind of touch on and, and uh, kind of review just so we have a starting point. So about uh, 2006, uh, NASA uh, used what was known as an evolutionary algorithm. And these had been talked about, theorized, worked on for a number of years already. But essentially, this is a, an algorithm that performs a task much the same way nature does in terms of natural selection. And so, can you hear me okay? It froze for like a few seconds. Yeah, yeah, that's what I saw. I just, I wasn't sure if that was me or system, but anyway, I'm uh, just going to back up just slightly. Uh, so NASA had started working with an evolutionary algorithm to be able to generate or create a very efficient, more efficient and small antenna for a particular satellite system that they were putting up. And so they plugged into this evolutionary algorithm, essentially the criteria that they wanted, and it would so generate, select, mutate, and continue generation after generation until it came up with a design that essentially no human ge uh, engineer was going to generate. This is one of many that were generated at the time. And that is one kind of use of a form of computer program or AI. But we are now moving into the era of GANs. This is something that's been uh, much more in the line of the neural networks that we're working with today. And these are generative adversarial networks. And essentially, there are two different computers that play against each other. One generates, one discriminates. And we now have images, videos, voices that can be generated that are based on no human being that actually exists. That's scary stuff already, but that's just the starting point of where these kinds of things can go. Now, GANs, generative ad adversarial networks, can be used for all kinds of optimization problems. So that's actually very, very useful in an increasingly complex world. But how, how might we use it in design? So you might remember from a few years ago, um, Natella had uh, used a GAN to uh, generate something like 7,000 different uh, designs for their uh, label. It wasn't uh, something that they act, it was more of a promo, uh, promotional thing. But uh, it was an interesting experiment to use it for. Uh, but then I think a year or more ago, there was an artist who wanted to apply it to chair design. And I've zoomed this in. There, there are so many more to this, uh, but uh, not all of them are functional. Not all of them are good design. But if you think about using a tool like this to generate ideas and then let human beings and human aesthetic be part of the selection process, that that actually could be a, an interesting way to utilize uh, a technology like this in going forward in terms of design and so forth. So in with all of that, uh, I think that we are going to be in for a very, very 
interesting and long ride uh, with technology. We are going to continue to uh, grow closer to it, work more closely with it. Uh, it's going to be our partner uh, well into the future. And um, more than we're not going to, it's not something we will be able to stop. It's an ongoing trend that's been going on for three and a half million years. So what we have to do is find solutions in order to create the kind of future that we want to live in. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really fascinating. You bring up so many different, uh, do you want to? I am yeah. I'm just unsharing there. Yeah. Am I, um, am I back? Okay, there we go. Well, the first, the, I, you know, I want to jump in because you, mm. there's so much, there's so much there, but the, the, the core that comes to mind uh, that's really tied to the sort of challenge that designers have in using artificial intelligence is up to this point, would you say, we've looked at machines as a, you know, when we think of a machine, we copy something that humans do. But the way in which we're sort of, the moment that we're at right now is to think about a way of augmenting and almost working as a counterpoint. And I had shared with you earlier this year, I had done a talk uh, uh, that talked about a, uh, the use, NASA was using uh, the concept of twinning and using uh, machines, if you were up in space for a very long time, do you need another version of you? Or do you need mm -hmm. a counterpoint of you to make sure that you don't become a version of you that will be dangerous for that mission? Do you understand? So there's, yep. this, so like, are we, is there anything that you could sort of add around that? Like mm -hmm. we've caught, we've used, it's sort of an engineering process and now we're moving to something else beyond an engineering process? Sure. Sure. Uh, amazing question, Tim. Yes, I remember the the paper you shared, and it, I think that takes that we could go down an entirely different road in terms of psychology. You know, talking about that one to for to talk about it in terms of how I see technology and AI at this stage, most certainly at this stage. Really, it's it goes well beyond this. But we've been many people, and this we can blame. The, the popular press to a degree for this. Think of AI as replacing human intelligence, re, re, somehow duplicating it. Uh, and this was, to be fair, some of the early thinking uh, in the early days, uh, long before they were going to even come close. Uh, interesting side point, the, uh, um, met the actual proposal for the Dartmouth uh, workshop that went on for like two and a half months uh, was saying that they thought they could overcome a number of the major uh, AI uh, challenges to get to a thinking machine uh, within the course of that summer. Uh, we're obviously generations beyond. But in, in terms of our the technology has always been a tool. If our relationship to it has become more intimate over time. But it's always been our tool to help us do things better. So in many respects, that's where we need to be looking to AI and other in increasingly intelligent systems. Uh, and I think that that's the part we have to remember. When, when we look ahead at this next decade or two, there's a lot of concern about uh, workforce issues, job loss, and so forth. A lot of the answer to that is that it's not all going to be going away a lot of it is still going to require human interaction, human insight, the level, the types of human intelligence that we still have exclusively. And so this is much more a matter of kind of creating a partnership, a working together, whether it's with AI and programs in a, in a virtual sense, robotics, uh, the robotic field now has a term called cobots, basically a, a, co, a robotic coworker. And these are, this is the idea that there are things that our machines can do better than we can. That's always been the case and the reason of why we would create it. We can go back to the Luddites of, you know, 200 years ago. And you know, it's like, we didn't do that to put people out of work. We did that because we could sew a lot faster and, you know, cheaper. And similarly, as we create new technologies, we're doing it to make things better. There's also profit motive that's being that's driving a bunch of it and that is also you know something that skews things that we have to look at but 
I think that ultimately we're going to need to think of it in terms of how do we work more efficiently with these systems and interfaces and design is, is part, certainly part of that. Um, but one of the things I'm trying to think, there was something about the nature of, oh, and that's it's essentially in the book, you may recall, Tim, uh, there's a point where I talk about the idea that um, when you talk about general intelligence, people talk about general intelligence as if we have general intelligence. We don't. We have intelligence that's very specific to how we evolved and our place in what's known as the cognitive niche of our ecosystem. That ability to try to make something entirely like us is going to hobble AI. AI is powerful for us because it thinks differently than us. We already create other humans very easily, a little too easily sometimes. But what we can do is use systems that can think better, can mine data differently and better than we can. We have to understand where the biases exist. We have to understand how the, it interacts with our biases. That, but that, that point that you're making, I want to just sort of jump in. Please, I, please. It t ties back to an earlier part of your talk in that you're talking about intelligent systems, but really when we've been developing what we have as a lot of AI today, have we really thought of it as a intelligent system? Because if it essentially, there's a point at which it doesn't work because mm -hmm. it, you know, it, you know, it, does it predict it's um, how it changes the people that it's affecting and how it works with these humans? Is it learning through the sort of, uh, uh, the messiness of humans, or does it rely upon what what I've, I've seen sort of over the last sort of, uh, especially over the last 10 years, is that a lot of what we've sort of talked about, if you, you see people doing presentations around AI, a lot of it requires people to sort of fit within the rules that that AI has, but that's not an intelligent system. It's to what you no. were talking about, which is one that doesn't rely upon it defining the rules, it can learn and adapt to the rules that we need. We have to think about sustainable systems. It's not sustainable if suddenly it makes people ill or it makes people, uh, or it creates an authoritarian political uh, environment mm -hmm. or whatever. Ab absolutely. Uh, one point when I was, talk was talking about early interfaces that I mentioned elsewhere frequently is the idea that what's been happening incrementally as we've been developing more and more sophisticated interfaces is that we've been moved early on. We had to learn very, very arcane ways of interacting with those systems. If, if anybody here is, most everybody here is young enough, they probably don't remember interacting with DOS or uh, a few other command line uh, interfaces, but it was definitely challenging for some people and earlier st stages even more so. Now, these systems work more and more on our terms, more and more in ways that are in keeping with us. Vo recognition or voice activation technology, that's becoming even more in that way. The speeches are, are one of our e easiest and most natural, earliest learned uh, interfaces, essentially. We interact with each other through speech. I, I, get, so, I, I get concerned with, with who, def who gets to define uh, sort of what, you know, what is considered to be the technology we need. If you look at, for example, mm -hmm. I mean, somebody like Elon Musk will speak about yeah. sort of the future of, of cars. And he'll talk about, uh, yeah. you know, sort of uh, boring and sort of automated systems or whatever. But the, if, you, if you look at what's actually happening there, is that really an intelligent system if there isn't any way to make it work for everybody. I, I tend to start seeing that there's a lot of bias because of how technology is currently paid for. It goes to your issue of regulation and issues of other contextual issues that drive a lot of what we consider intelligent systems uh, at any point in history. Sure, sure. Uh, I think that there's a, a number of different aspects to touch on there. Uh, certainly the marketplace has always been a 
developer of technology kind of mentioned that uh, some place in terms of the idea that it, it plays part of the selection role that is kind of equivalent to what goes on in natural selection. This is not necessarily the best way to do things in tr for uh, human beings. On the other hand, when we've tried to do a top-down type of approach to technological development and the marketplace and so forth, it tends to run into all kinds of other kinds of problems and some of them very anti-humanistic as well. So it's a really challenging balancing act, but I think that we, I was having this conversation just last night, you know, we've been coming into an era of in the last few years, last four or five years, just an absolute explosion of num the number of people working in uh, the ethics of AI space. Uh, this is something that uh, we're recognizing that this is a, a something that's really important to us because it, it relates to what we are and what we need. So I think that th it's that kind of response. We can't just say, oh, we're just going to keep doing things the way that we always have. Not saying that that's what you were suggesting. But if we go, as we go forward, we have to create new processes in order to manage our increasingly intelligent, differently intelligent world. And some of those are things like having ethics of AI committees, having different ways of being able to audit the data that's being used, ways of siloing data for our protection that currently are pretty open to those you know, organizations that want to harvest it and so forth. So we're actually having to play catch up on a lot of different levels, but it's kind of this push-pull thing that mm. has gone on in any ecosystem, be it a natural one or uh, a more technological one over the, the millennia. Yeah, it's a question of how well we learn from our history. Are we looking at, very, I mean, a more mundane system you could look at would be, you know, the interstate system and the automobile and how okay. it created suburbia. And there's a crisis in terms of what suburbia is. It's not, it, it, it reached a point of unsustainability. Mm -hmm. And it was a, so it was, was it an intelligent system, but it was driven by, you know, industrial manufacturing, you know, economy of scale and, and all that. So like, you know, right now, are we looking at things in the same way in terms of AI? Mm -hmm. AI is sort of the new kind of the new space in terms of it's a much more abstract space. Are we going to suddenly mm -hmm. hit a point of unsustainability? But the problem is, is that the, 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 the sort of outcomes might be behavioral changes in human beings. Like you were talking about, right. you know, facial recognition and emotional AI. Will people begin to change the way in which they gesture and you'll have different yep. human traits because people will know they're being watched all the time. You know, is there, you know, there's all these kinds of other outcomes that are ethical questions that mm -hmm. sort of bring a much more abstract kind of uh, sort of, uh, sort of set of problems for designers in the future. Absolutely. Uh, I think we can point to just about everything you, you're, you know that within the future space, we're, you know, one of the things that we focus on is what are the unanticipated consequences? Uh, but this is, that said, you can try to anticipate all you want. You're not going to get all of it. There are going to be all kinds of things that will come about. Just, you know, what you're saying about what changes with our gestures, what changes with our behaviors, just look at this past year with the pandemic. Nothing to do with technological change. We've had a, a, an actual you know, beginnings of a pandemic that have forced us to utilize our technology, utilize our knowledge to change our behaviors, change our inter ways of interacting uh, to try and protect ourselves. And that will have down the way I'll, I have no doubt it will have unintended and negative consequences. I'm, I'm imagining, and I'm very sorry for, I'm just thinking about the number of children, young children, that aren't 
seeing the kind of socialization from, you know, in, in school uh, interaction that, uh, you know, or for that matter, being told from a young age, you know, stay away from that person, don't go near that person, that changes people. And that's going to change our world in the generation to come. Uh, so literally everything, the choices we make with technology, but our responses to the environment, all of this alters us. And it's a continual, iterative cycle of adaptation. You've, you've created an awesome segue that I'd like to pass over to anyone in the class who would like to ask any questions of Richard right now. Anybody want to, to offer up a question? Open to anything anyone <laughs> wants to talk about. <laughs> Anybody? Nobody? Everybody's quiet, quiet, quiet. You, 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 go, go ahead. I, uh, Hello? Yeah. I, I read this book. It's called 21 Lessons for the 21st Century by yes. Yuval and there's this um, point of view of his. He says, um, if the artificial intelligence and bio biological technology keep like advancing, and there's gonna be one day that um, like the society is gonna be more and more polarized, and the rich people are gonna like genetically reconstruct themselves and mm -hmm. permanently become like a different species than what we are now, human beings. What do you? Um, what do you think of this? Great question. Uh, thank you. Uh, is it is it Kiao? How? Kiao. Uh, Kiao. Very yeah. very nice to meet you. Uh, great question. I think that um, I, I, first of all, great admiration for Noah Yuval Harari. Uh, the thing he he has a uh, a certain perspective. I think that there's a lot of possibility in that. It's not a definite. Uh, one of the things about technology that has always been the case is that early on, uh, the, the rich, the wealthy have early access to many aspects of technology that are, they perceive to be beneficial, that give them a competitive advantage and so forth, whether that's computers early on and, and internet access, or if it's, um, you know, some other, you know, let's say, access to vaccines or what have you in this current era. That's always been the case with technology. So we're going to almost certainly see that with any kind of, you know, increasing working together or merger with human beings and uh, technology. Uh, yeah there's a lot of concern that one of the ways that that could manifest is that we'll see a whole society of haves and have nots. Uh, but if we look at and talk about what that really means for ourselves, for our humanity, for our society, uh, and have that conversation, recognize the possibility and say, okay, can we do this differently? Is there, are there benefits, and I think there are, to not doing it that way? Because one of the greatest, uh, po most powerful aspects of any system, be it a population, a society, um, it, it, it is the diversity of thought, the diversity of ideas, the diversity of different types of input to be able to have a not just a rich society but one that is resilient and i think that that might be a way toward a, a solution there but certainly there have been those who argue that that's a, not just a possibility but a dangerous one so uh yeah thank you for the question i i don't know if i really answer it other than just kind of riff on it but hopefully that addresses a little bit of it thank you thank you Anyone else? No? I was, I was just going to ask, like, hmm. just talking about, like, creating new um, AI or, like, this third kind of, like, a kind of third iteration of AI is developing, like, building upon, like, old data sets instead of just creating new ones is, like, what happens when you, like, encounter a problem that needs new solutions? Is that kind of just, like, used 
as like a reference to create new data or is it is it built upon like the patterns of that old data or um i i take it it's a great question zachary i i i take your point i'm i actually don't have a full answer i can you know make a a couple of suggestions about it so as we develop technologies in general we don't throw away the old ones just because something new comes along and similarly as we develop beyond the first wave of ai the second wave of ai uh we're certainly not going to throw that away but we're also not necessarily going to build these systems the same way uh the the nature of neural networks is that the way they're trained is very very it's very data intensive but it's very mathematical intensive and they're effectively considered to be black boxes there are people working to get around this but they don't build on prior knowledge and so one of the things that happens when you take a system that has been trained to let's just say uh play uh you know chess and you tell it i want you now to learn how to play checkers well for a lot of the systems uh, though they've been working on some alternates uh what happens is something called catastrophic forgetting and you re it relearns how to play checkers from the get go from the start but it now has lost or forgotten how to play chess so that's the kind that's really requiring an almost fundamental change in how the systems work when you look at trying to develop a system that builds knowledge and learns from prior experience as one type of future ai as you talk about systems that can learn from uh what's known as one shot learning or zero shot learning uh one shot learning is essentially instead of needing a million pictures of a cat to be able to recognize cats in the future you see one or two like a child does and it's like oh from that point on you know what a cat looks like now you tell something you tell that program of uh, a tiger looks like a cat only it has stripes now you don't know what a tiger looks like you've never seen a tiger but the program if it can learn from that piece of information that's known as zero shot learning it's actually built on prior knowledge and not using any experience of a tiger to be able to recognize one in the future so these are really really fundamental changes in the overall structure that these kinds of ai systems are using to to be able to achieve what they'll achieve so will they need some of that other kinds of really really dense data maybe for certain types of things but it's more like using certain referencing old programs while you're interacting with a newer one so it's it's not um a given that it's going to be reliant on the weaknesses of the the old system it'll what certainly have it it'll only have its own it'll have its own biases no doubt one of the uh sort of uh sort of concepts that is covered in in our class is piaget's um uh, assimilation accommodation sort of the acquisition of language and sort of recognizing how human beings acquire language and how that's different from how a machine learns and then goes through that process that you were just talking about Richard yeah. that the whole idea of narrative and and sort of there's other sort of there's th the what we imagine how a machine thinks and how a human thinks is that those sort of you know the concept of connotation how we sort of associate certain words with yep. images and so forth and how it can change over time isn't something that a machine it, it's not in it's not in an algorithm you can teach a machine to begin to mimic certain things and it could probably mm -hmm. find those things but it's still there is something in, in, inherently human in how we go about mm -hmm. and acquire language and it's why thinking in stories for humans is very you, you know getting a machine to think in stories is it's is a harder process sure. you know would you have you ever sort of come across any kind of research around sort of narrative analysis in terms of I, machines 
uh, fantastic uh, line uh, there, Tim. I've actually been thinking quite a bit recently about story and what that means for human intelligence and other kinds of intelligence. I don't have a lot of answers about it yet, but what I do know is that what's probably going to happen, we could probably look down the road a century, maybe two, maybe less, I don't know, uh, and see systems that are going to be able to tell a story, be able to, uh, you know, be almost as, uh, almost indistinguishable from a very high-end, you know, human storyteller, Shanaki, what have you. What isn't going to necessarily happen, at least for a very, very long time, is what's going on internally for that system. Is it does it actually know what it's doing? Is it actually experiencing that? Does it actually have any kind of consciousness around this? That's all, it, it, it becomes trickery uh, at, at that point. But it, at a certain level, is trickery really important to, is knowing that it's trickery really important to us. If we're interacting with our Alexas, with our different chatbots, AI assistants, and so forth, not right now, but a decade from now, two decades from now, and it's able to interact with us in ways that is almost indistinguishable from speaking with another human being on the phone, is that if they're if they're performing a role for us, acting as our assistant, act, acting even as a uh, some kind of therapist or a guide in you know dealing with certain kinds of challenges in in your life, is that necessarily a bad thing? Do we really care whether there is a consciousness there or not? It's a really you know it's a deep philosophical question, but. Uh, as uh, I, you know, maybe some of your students are familiar with Nagel's uh, uh, paper, uh, Thomas Nagel, uh, uh, What Is It Like to Be a Bat?, in which he explores the nature of consciousness and intelligence and how it is not really feasible for us to really understand or be able to put ourselves in the shoes of another kind of entity. We do a reasonable job with theory of mind and interacting and doing that with other human beings. But in terms of doing that with another species and much, and much less than that, doing it with something that's not even biological, uh, it, that's gonna be a big, big challenge. It may not necessarily be overcomeable. One of the, it's, it's interesting because next, next week, uh, our class moves on to the idea of storytelling and mm -hmm. archetypes and the history of of oral storytelling is really yeah. the history of intelligence because Absolutely. as the storyteller went from village to village and told the same story, they weren't simply telling that story exactly the same, it was received and the story was as much about how it was received and then how it was interpreted and then how they told their friends and so forth. And that is a very, that process in which we receive and sort of mutate something information data that comes in is you is is you know is very uniquely human understanding human. how that works and you know there's uh you know joseph campbell developed the you know hero's journey and mm -hmm. you have uh people like kurt vonnegut developed uh, sort of developed a, i think he did his masters on on that there is so, there's a there's a finite number of stories that we have as human beings that we repeat mm -hmm. but they don't they're not always the same. And so like, if a machine did that, it's like, that's sort of like the idea of, you know, there is a, there's a certain algorithm to being human beings, but somehow it yeah. doesn't follow the same kind of, uh, you know, binary kind of a sort of a process that as, as, as we would see with the machine. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's an interesting area. It, it is. I, I, would, I would posit that as we move down the way, we're not going, as we move into the future, that it's that behavior, that interaction won't be on the part of the machines. So, as you say, binary or so evidently algorithmic. Yeah. Uh, if you, I don't know if anybody here has played with GPT-3, the um, new algorithm from OpenAI that is based on something like 175 million 
uh, elements. But anyway, it essentially you can it, it can generate an article, a very reasonably good article. Not it can be nonsense. It can be you know pretty useful. You can totally imagine it being used for robotic uh, uh, article writing in the not too distant future. But um, at a certain point. It, that doesn't have to get a lot better before it, be, it, it takes people time to actually t say, is this from a person or is this from, uh, you know, a, a bot? Uh, somebody was using it on Reddit for about a week uh, and it was generating very extensive comments, you know, long ones that were, uh, you know, it took, it, you know, they were happening like every few minutes mm -hmm. and, people were saying, is this a bot? Is that, this is too good to be a bot. And then somebody actually tuned in and figured out it was GPT-3. There, there's, there's influence. There's, I mean, there's a whole load of influencers that are, that are, are bots that people don't realize are bots. Yeah, because absolutely. They, have, they follow a certain pattern and, you know, they know there's, you know, there's a, there's a feedback loop that mm -hmm. is repeatable. If yeah. you if you say certain things, and politics has been an area of this as well. Absolutely, absolutely. The uh, I can't help but uh, reference uh, for anybody who wants the the uh, historical. The uh, there was a cartoon I don't know twenty years ago, thirty years ago, uh, on the internet. No one knows you're a dog, and it's a dog sitting on at a computer. More to the point, at this stage on the internet, no one knows you're a bot. That's coming very very quickly. So, yeah. well. I, I really thank you so much for um, uh, sharing uh, so much great thinking today, uh, Richard. Really, thank you so a much. lot in this time, and, and it's really useful. Um, and uh, I, you know, if any of the students have any other questions, I might throw them to you. But uh, absolutely, thank you again, please. And uh, I hope we it's, have a chance to chat again soon. Absolutely, it's been a real pleasure. I thank you all for listening. Th thank you, Tim, for inviting me. I uh, had a lot of fun, and uh, I wish you all luck in the rest of your course. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Take thank care you. now. Take care. Bye now. Thank Be safe. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, everybody. So, um, we're running a little. Uh, we're running a little longer um, uh, with the talk. I hope everybody enjoyed.